Thank you. Um, Swadika. This is how we <laughs> say hello in Thailand. Uh, thank you for coming here. I will be speaking about Sonoratia of Alta Pollination. And this is part of my master's thesis. So I uh, no, no. Anybody attended the previous ATBC and they actually heard part of this. So um, first, what is Sonoratia ovata? So we know this tree in different names. Some of us call it Pedada, some of us call it Lanken, and some of us call it Gadabu. It is a mangrove tree and you can find it not at the coast, but somewhere a bit up. So you can <coughs> see it in firm mud, but still in the area where there is salt water influence. So it's still a mangrove area, but not at the beach, not you know where the seawater is. And uh, they have white flowers. So you can see these flowers in the dark. And these white flowers are odorous. You can smell them even if you can't find them. And they have both female and male parts in one flower. So the female parts in this picture, the female part is that green thing, the one that's sticking out in the middle, and the male part is the white area. They produce fleshy fruits, and these fruits are edible. So I've tasted them. They're very sour. They're even sour than calamansi. Um, <laughs> More sour than that. So people, sometimes they make candies out of them. They, they taste like tamarind candies. And sometimes they use them as, like in, in, instead of vinegar, they use them in soups to make the soup sour. And of course, like all mangroves, they have specialized roots so that they can breathe even if there's water. So this, this species, this mangrove tree, is a near threatened species. And the reason is because most of the area where they survive have been converted for aquaculture. So a lot of them are now um, shrimp farms and fish farms. But thankfully, they are widely distributed. So yes, you can find them here in the Philippines, in Central Philippines, and they can be found in Indonesia, all the way up to Papua New Guinea. Also, another good thing is that they're self-compatible. So if you have pollen from that flower and you pollinate that flower, it will produce fruits. It is also possible to cross-pollinate them. So if you have pollen from a different flower or a different tree, it will produce fruits. But now we have to ask the question, um, are they actually surviving? They're near fed and are they gonna disappear in the future? Are they reprodu reproducing properly? So we asked the question, how important is cross-pollination compared to self-pollination in this species? Is it important that other pollen from different trees be there so that they can reproduce? So I did my study in southern Thailand, and I had three sites, Koyo, Kuangke, and Batang. So these are all in southern Thailand, and um, for simplicity's sake, in this seminar, I'm discussing three of the treatments that I used for my pollination experiment. So these three are, the first is open pollination. So open pollination is when I leave the flowers as they are. I don't touch them, I don't do anything to them, just you know, keep them normal. The second one is spontaneous autogamy. So this is when I force them to self-pollinate. They don't give them a choice. So how do I do that? I bag them. And these bags have little holes in them so that the flowers can still breathe, but the holes are just one millimeter in diameter. So no insects can go in, no bats can go in, no uh, birds can go in, nothing. And nothing's bigger than one millimeter. And the last one is insect pollination. So what I do is I put the flowers in baskets, and these baskets have holes that are three centimeters in diameter. So insects can go in. Like a lot of the bees can go in, um, stingless bees or regular bees. Um, some moths can go in. But not bats, not birds, because the holes are too small. And of course, I try to observe what visits the flower. So not only do I do this um, pollination experiment, I also have to observe what visit them, what would visit them. And I did this by sight, by using camera traps. So for camera traps, I did 31 camera trap nights. 
and then I did mist netting to see what what works or bats are visible. And I did this for two nights. So for two nights, I started it at 5.30 in the evening. So this is um, before sunset, all the way up to midnight. So how do we know what is reproductive success? So what I looked at to, to check what reproductive success is, or how I define reproductive success, I did it in two ways. So there's pollination success and food cell. Pollination success is when the flowers survive for more than two weeks. This means that the flowers are pollinated. If the flowers fall before two weeks, it means the flowers are not pollinated. So that's pollination success. And fruit set is when the flowers turn into mature fruits. This would take about eight weeks or nine weeks. And to analyze the data, I pulled all the data that I gathered from my case sites, and I used generalized linear mixed model. And to analyze the data, I had to use binomial distribution and check them against treatment. And I used random fact, uh, three individual as random factors. So I did all the analysis using R and even the graphs I used R program to work on. So what are the results after doing all that tree climbing and wrapping the, the, the flowers and checking what visits? I found out that the model that best describes pollination success involves treatment. So treatment has an effect on pollination success. And this means that open pollination is significantly higher or produce significantly higher pollination success than spontaneous autogamy. And then for fruit set, it's the same thing. Treatment also has an effect on fruit set. And the same thing, open pollination is significantly higher than spontaneous autogamy. So when you force them to self-pollinate, they only produce a very small amount of fruits. They don't produce as much as when it's open pollinated. And for the floral visitors, I think I went too fast. <laughs> for the floral visitors, um, we have, I found red weaver ants. So you, I think we call them hantik, am I right? Hantik in the Philippines and is that right? And then, uh, so I found these. These are the ones that you see in this picture. They, oh, they're, they get, they, they're everywhere in the tree and they mostly gather near the flowers. But they don't really go to the anthers or the stigma. Instead, what, what I found them mostly doing is far, farming aphids. Are you familiar with that? So aphids produce something sweet and they collect that. So that's what they eat. So they protect the aphids. And in the same process, I suppose they protect the tree from all, all other living things that would try to live there. I also found a lot of stainless trees. So I forgot to tell you that um, these flowers, they only last about a night. Mm -hmm. And then by morning, by mid-morning, they, they, most of the anthers have fallen. So you can see in this picture, it's not a full flower anymore, like the one I showed you earlier. So um, at around, eight all the way until a little before it gets too hot so around 10 or 11 it depends on how shaded the area is i suppose there would be stingless bees flying around and what they're interested in are pollen and these stingless bees are quite amazing they're like ace fighters when they land on a an anther they really land on the anther they don't land anywhere else Unless maybe there's really strong wind, I'm not sure. But I've never seen them land on anything else that they want to land on. So I've never seen them touch the stigma. I've only seen them touch the anthers and get pollen. So these are the only two species that I observed <coughs> actually touching the flowers. I mean, insects. I didn't see them touch, uh, I didn't see anything else. But I did observe hawk moths and, and bees but not in the same area where the sun Rachel Alvata are. So they were in um, the research center or along the road, but not there. So it's possible that I have missed them when I was observing the, the flowers. But for now, this too, I'm sure, and I've caught them, so I know that they're, they visited the flowers. There's another one, it's a brown throated sunbird, and it's not a very good picture. I just used my phone to to catch 
they were so fast so they come in early in the morning this is when the nectar is already declining the amount of nectar is already declining and what they do is they don't actually go into in front of the flower as you can see in the picture they land like at next to the flower and at the side and then they hang upside down and then they push their beak at the side so they're practically not touching the anthers or the stigma at all they're just drinking nectar from the, sand, from the side and then they would fly off and the last one is macroglossus minimus so these bats we have observed to land on the flowers and i will tell you a little bit more about them later but among these four that I observed touching the flowers, only Macroglossus minimus was the one touching both the anchors and the stigma. So the other three were, uh, I couldn't prove that they were pollinators, but definitely this one, Macroglossus minimus, I, I saw with my own eyes that they were touching both the anthers and the stigma. But there's only one species of bats in your why would there be only one species? But let's answer that in a bit. So first, let's go back to the research question. How important is cross-pollination compared to sub-pollination in Sonoratia ovata? So we tried to answer that question, right? How much does this one bat contribute, this one species of bat, are they important? We saw in the graphs that open pollination produces higher, higher pollination success and higher food cell. So in terms of pollination success, you can see that open pollination produces a third more of, um, well, flowers that survives rather than spontaneous autogamy. And in terms of um, fruit cell, they produce twice as much as spontaneous autogamy. So if we're trying to think about it like this, imagine the ash fall, right? We are all affected by it. Uh, all of us in plus minus and nearby places anyway. If you are trying to clean your roof and you are spontaneous autogamy, what you would do is just grab a hose, stand on the ground, and hose down your, your, your roof. So in a day, you're probably cleaning it, let's say about 20% of the roof because not all of it will be washed away, right? Some of them would be in the gutter, and some of them you can't reach with your hose. But if you're open pollination, you actually go up the roof with a brush, and you have water, and you clean everything that you can. Of course, you can't clean everything, so you probably only clean 50%. But this is a lot more. Like, it's cleaner. So it's the same thing with open pollination. You are more successful with what you're doing with open pollination. Now, you're probably wondering why it's pollination so it's the same it's the same fruits I'll tell you later why let's look at macroglossus minimus first why is there only one bat species so macroglossus minimus is a very cute bat as you can see not all bats are scary and uh, this is the smallest macroglossid so macrogloss macroglossids can be found in old world in the old world and the old world is Southeast Asia, Papua New Guinea, that area, Africa, South Asia. So these macroglossids have long snouts and they have really long tongues. And the reason for that is because they only eat nectar and pollen. So they don't, you don't find them eating other stuff. They're focused on that. And they are, these bats are agile. So they're small, they're agile, but they're not long distance flyers. So according to Winkleman, he observed that uh, these bats can only fly up to one kilometer away from their roost. So if you want to feed them, their food should be less than one kilometer away. If it's more than that, they probably won't reach it. They can't fly that far, but they are agile. Uh, despite the fact that they're agile, agile, they're not really graceful. Have you ever seen a bat feed? Has anybody seen a bat feed? No? Yes, yes. Okay. So bats feed. This is the flower, right? They don't just hover like this, right? Yeah? Okay. So what they do when they land is they go like that. And then all the pollen gets and then they have pollen over here and over here under their wings. And then when they feed, they push their heads inside the flower a little bit. So all the pollen is here. 
and then they feed on the nectar. And then one, they just stay there for one or two seconds. And one of the reasons is probably because they have, there's a lot of mm -hmm. honey on the flower, but also because they're trying to be, trying not to get eaten by other predators, by predators. So they fly away very quickly, they go to another tree. This species, when I observed them, they didn't go from like one tree, they didn't go this flower and then this flower and this flower. No, they didn't. They go from one tree to another tree to another tree, maybe they go back, but they don't generally stay in one tree. So they go to the flower, they get all the pollen on them, and then they fly to another flower in another tree, bringing all that pollen with them, right? So when they land, remember where, they, where the stigma is? Yeah? Okay, so the stigma is right pointing at in the middle of the flower, and when they land, they touch that. So all the pollen gets deposited there. And that's how pollination occurs. And that's how you do cross-pollination. You go from one flower to another, which makes them very good cross-pollinating agents. And uh, this is an observation that I made when I was watching the sonoracea trees. These bats tend to stay away from illuminated flowers. So if you have a tree right next to the street light and there are two flowers, they would go to the one that's shaded and they would completely not visit the other one that's illuminated. So they're shy bats. I mean, um, I don't think this applies to all the bats, but definitely for the species, that's what I saw them do. Okay, so we know a little bit about uh, macroglossus minimus. Now let's look at the tree. Why is there only one bat species? Why is only one bat species important when it comes to uh, pollinating this tree. So what do you see? What do you see in the picture? It's pretty small, but... No! <laughs> so aside from the, the hunting <coughs> nest, please, please ignore the hunting nest. <laughs> Aside from that, what do you see? Do you see fruits? Fruit, yeah. Do you see a lot of fruits? Yeah? yeah. Okay. So yeah. <coughs> there are a lot of fruits. And when this photo was taken, my friend was standing right next to the trunk. So this is this can be seen from under the canopy. Remember these trees are are mangrove trees, but they're not very big. In fact, among the four sonoracious species in Thailand, this is the smallest one. And most of bat trees, what they do is they produce their flowers and their fruits at the edge so that bats can easily access them. But as you can see in this picture, a lot of the fruits and the flowers are under, are inside the canopy. And it takes someone with great agility to enter that place, right? There's branches and leaves. It's like an obstacle course before you get to the flower. In fact, I can climb this tree and most of the flowers I can reach that's how inside the, the flowers are. Of course, some of them are also outside, but there are a lot inside too. So you need to be a very good climber, an agile one to be able to access it. Additionally, like I said, it's a small tree and a lot of the trees are much bigger. So we have four species, this is the smallest one. Under that, you have um, undergrowth. There are a lot of, you know, all those bushes and nipa growing under sonoracea. And then on top of that, there are the taller trees like um, like um, Sonoracea griffithii. So this is the tallest one, and they can really tower up the canopy. So they this one can grow about 12 meters in height. That one can grow about 35 meters in height. It's really tall. Um, other species like Sonoracea alba, this is the one that you normally see or you normally think about when you think Sonoracea. These are the ones at the beach. So as you can see in the picture, there's a lot of space, right? And if you're a bigger bat, like Eonicteris pelea, this is easier to access. The tall ones and the ones that are not so so close together. So there's a lot of space for them. They're fast flyers, Eonicteris pelea is a lot faster, and they, they can travel farther, but they're not as agile as, as Macroglossus minimus. So at least in my, the area where I study, Sonoracea alvata are it, like it's very close to the area and it keeps away all the bigger bats. 
However, if you are in a different situation, like you plant Sunrichia ovata in an open area, then maybe, maybe it will interest other bats, other bigger bats. But in that area, it's not the case. There's only one bat. Another thing is that these are flowers. There are two species. These are two species of Sonoracea. And the one at the bottom is Sonoracea alvata. The other one at the top, the other bigger ones, are another species. And you can see how small it is compared to the other one, right? So if you're a bigger bat, you've flown far away, wouldn't you be more interested in something bigger that produces more nectar than someone that's small and you have to go in and try to get flowers and nectar? Am I right? Does that make sense? Okay, so that's another reason why only Macroglossus minimus is interested in the smaller flowers. So how important is this bat species again? They make reprodu the, the reproductive effort more worthwhile. So as you saw, they produce twice as much as twice as much fruits as um, self-pollination does. And then they may prevent or reduce inbreeding. So um, as we know, the environment is changing. There's climate change and everything. And every, all the animals and plants have to adjust, right? And if you are self-pollinating um, self or inbreeding, then you don't really have a lot of new stuff coming out, new traits. But with cross-pollination, you do produce new traits, possibly, if there are enough. And this might help you survive in this changing world. So yes, bats are important. They, they help prevent inbreeding or at least reduce it. Now that we know how bats affect um, Sonoracea ovata, Let's see what we can do to, to help them not get worse, like not become threatened. So one, of course, is we have to protect the habitats of both trees and bats. Like I mentioned, the bats live very close to the flowers. So if you protect the entire habitat, then you can also protect the bats. And this is what IUCN actually recommends. Another thing is, well, you protect the bats. So have, have you ever seen um, nets being put on top of trees to protect the, the fruits. So a lot of them are like, they're just loose nets. They put them on top. And any bat that flies near it or to the fruits or flowers gets stuck in that. And then they die because they get stuck in there and then it becomes morning and they, they're, they're sunbathing, they get dehydrated and they're starving. So it kills them. So we must stop this. If you are putting nets on top of your trees, make sure they're tight so that you get, don't get anything stuck in there and allow it to die. Another thing is that in Thailand, a lot of the farmers are so afraid of bats that they put mist nets. They just leave them there day and night for weeks and weeks. It catches birds, it catches bats, and they just let them rot there. That's another thing that we should stop. It's not healthy. We know that bats and birds all all have their ecological significance and they provide us with a lot of benefits. If we let them do this, it's not really good for um, pollination and other things and seed dispersal. And lastly, uh, this is also good for our pockets. So let's try not to leave unnecessary, unnecessary lights on if they are near um, bad pollinated flowers. So I said this is good for our pockets because it saves us energy from paying the electricity. But um, like I said, these bats are quite shy when it comes to light. So if we have unnecessary lights on, then the bats won't visit those flowers. Uh, this is actually a published study. This, is, um, this has been published in Tropical Nature History. And it's available, it's an open access journal, so you can access it. And this is some of the literature that I use, but not completely. And I would like to thank my university uh, for letting me do this study, as well as the, all the other institutions listed here. And I would like to thank all the people who helped me with my work, and as well as everyone who is listening to me right now. Kopinha.